and welcome to the Pain and Bride Quarterly's podcast, The Slush Pile. We call it The Slush Pile because um, we get so many submissions. We get about 300 submissions a week. We accept 1.7%, last time I checked, submittables analytics of what we receive, um, which is all great news, really. Uh, uh, I, for one, am super excited that people are writing and reading to this degree. Um, and, you know, just the other day we had a PBQ meeting and one of our newer editors just came here from Canada by way of India. Yeah. And um, he was saying that he just could not get over how many choices he has to make every single day of which poetry event mm. to attend. So um, all of that said, um, we still hand curate every single piece that comes to us um, with our democratic editorial policy, and um, it does slow things down. But we get to feel um, extra excited when we do accept something, and we hope it makes our authors extra excited as well. Um, so what we're about to do is have a micro editorial meeting today because um, the I that's speaking is Kathleen Volkmiller and I am an essayist and director of the graduate program in publishing and a professor here at Drexel University. And we are back in the studio. Woohoo! Hooray. We haven't been here since what, Joe? June? Earlier? Earlier. Yeah. Much earlier. Yeah, like April of last year. Uh, we've been floating about, borrowing spaces, using my office. We've been all over. So we're back in the studio, and we hope that the um, audio sounds even better for you, um, our listeners. And um, so, yeah, so I'm back. I'm back in the insulated, very cool space. And Marion, where are you? I am sitting in my apartment in Abu Dhabi, and I um, am looking out at a darkened campus. It's around 8.30 at night here, um, and my face is reflected in the glass of my windows by the strange lunar light of my, my computer. Um, <laughs> and what is also reflected in this lovely moonlight of my computer is my giant new microphone. Oh, so, word. To our listeners, point taken, right? We realize fully how... Um, scratchy and robotic our voices sound when we call in sometimes so uh, we're experimenting with new technologies so I've got a two-fisted grip on a giant silver microphone <laughs> stop <laughs> you're taking this podcast in a new direction oh my god <laughs> over to Joseph <laughs> Hello, I'm Joseph, Kathy's current co-op. I'm an English major at Drexel, second year, and an unpublished writer, hopefully <laughs> going to be published eventually. That's like my 2018 goal for the year. A to-be-published writer. Yeah. <laughs> to-be-published. Right, like, right. Will be published in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have no doubts. Um, all right, so we have uh, uh, just this intimate group today, and we're discussing three poems by Michelle Wolf. Um, Marion, I've adopted a new term, and I'm going to use it all the time. We were early adopters of Michelle Wolf, and um, boy, is that list is that list grown, right? So many, so many amazing poets have. Um, have been published by PBQ earlier in their careers, and it's just such a joy when they come back again. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, we have three, and I guess, Mayor, if you don't mind, I'll just jump right in on this one. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the first one up is To Orbit the Earth. The steel capsule, ridged and riveted, an oversized can, rests suspended at street level, docked inside the Air and Space Museum's entrance. A bounty of white lilies mingled with spider mums, placed yesterday, honors the trail of pilot John Glenn, dead at 95. In 1962, even a second grader, gripped by the grainy blast off in black and white, knew that the compact can was a bleak conveyance that that helmeted dad, a human Superman laced up in a silver suit, could at any moment be lost in flames. And yet we launch from terra firma, compelled to behold the blue orb, its panorama of oceans as they curve from continent to continent. It knocks you down, this vision, 
your ache to enfold the globe in your arms. It is the child who slips into the darkness, sounding a cry you cannot ease, although you circle round and round. Wow. Nice reading. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll tell you, Michelle Wolf knows so much about the rhythm of lines and line breaks <laughs> and these, these sort of like long, almost like breathing lines that mm-hmm. she's got like mm-hmm. on the page. Um, it's just a, it was a, it's like a pleasure to trace along as you read that aloud. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I think one of the things I really admire in this piece is the the sort of sense making at the end, right? It like the that volta, the and yet we launch from terra firma. So we've got that description of of the flowers in honor of, of John Glenn um, at the foot of the the memorial, the spaceship, right? And then and yet we launch from terra firma, right? And you think this is going to be a sort of like a sentimental, like you know, my heart leaps out to the space to you know infinite discovery, <coughs> and then you get it's the child who slips into darkness, sounding a cry we cannot ease, although you circle round and round, like, oh, I didn't expect that. And it and it it is a pang, right? Like it's a a lovely pang at the end mm-hmm. Of, mm-hmm. of this description. Yeah, it's like a painful beauty kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, listeners, uh, if you're new, you don't know that you can go to our website, pbqmag.org, and read this poem so that you can see how it sits on the page. Um, my apologies for screwing up one line, one word in one line. I said in 1962, but it's in 62. Mm. Um, so just so you know. so um, And she uses some M dashes and, uh, as Marion said, kind of wider lines. Mm. But you can go and check that out. This that poignancy at the end is really what slays me. Um, anybody who knows my sensibilities would know that. Uh, well, and for some reason, I, I am compelled to say this. This is so personal. But when we first bought our house and I was uh, cleaning the house, like literally the first week of living there, I remember actually crying one day because I wanted to to hug the house <laughs> like I, I was like I was so I didn't know how to show the house how much I loved it mm. and I was in this like beautiful pain with my inability to give the house a hug to give the house a hug <laughs> and does that make sense that it that, does. that yeah. Yeah. it does well all right so that like so the, I think if I'm you're helping me be a little bit more articulate about the the, the pang at the end of this poem, right? Which is like the first part of the pang is that like Orphaic look back, right? At the at the at the earth is like a big blue marble. Like you can, mm-hmm. you know, as he's winging around the the globe, suddenly the globe is a globe in a way that was never fully seen or beheld before in a way, right? Yeah. So there's that. Like you suddenly want to hold the 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 us of us, right? In, mm-hmm. on the earth. And then the second thing, though, this vision, your ache to enfold the globe in your arms, it is that child who slips into the darkness, sounding a cry you cannot ease, although you circle round and round. Now we're the people circling round and round, right? Listening for this this cry, um, this pain that's just like off stage or in the distance, right? And we're activated and entered. So it's, I don't know, like she, she gives us this sort of like expected sentimental moment and then this other thing happens and I'm, I'm hard pressed to like name what that emotion is but it makes me really curious and interested so there <laughs> <clears throat> yeah yeah I like to it. think oop, Go ahead. I like to think that just like something that I think about like when I'm writing or journaling or thinking about feelings and emotion is that a lot of emotions just with language aren't definitively like one word Mm -hmm. and it's like from what I'm getting it's like those last three lines like it knocks or well like three and a half like from the second half of that fourth line from the bottom like through to the end it's like that whole thing is itself a feeling like that whole thing is itself a description of an emotion that just like the word doesn't exist in the English language but mm-hmm. 
it's like, you know, we sort of connect to it and we understand the feeling that the author is portraying there. Mm-hmm. But it's not definitively like one thing. It's not like just somber or mm-hmm. just sort of sad or just like sort of great and awesome and happy. It's mm-hmm. just, it's a whole lot of things. It's like images and colors and like this raw feeling and description that you're just sort of immersed in that you don't really have words for, but you know, everybody sort of gets. Yeah, it knocks you down. Yeah, it knocks you down. It knocks you down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and Joseph, thank you, right? The, t- the title of the poem is To Orbit the Earth. Mm-hmm. So it's it's this like double imagining, right? It's yeah. imagining one hurtling around, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then imagining Glenn looking back at us, right? Like mm-hmm. that, that double position there is um, is pretty fascinating. And, I, and yeah, everything that you just said is absolutely right. And I think that's what poets are poets, yeah. right? Like poets, that's the project to find, find language for these mm-hmm. nuances of emotion that escape us in some ways, mm-hmm. right? In daily mm-hmm. language, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, I, um, I, think, I think we might be ready to vote. It's yeah, less, it's less voices that. than normal, so I think that's why it's shorter. You know, yeah. we're, we're the conversation is done for the three of us, right? Right. But I also just want to note too: there's like a serious pattern of like Martian poems, space poem, extraterrestrial poems in the slush pile, right? I don't know if if you really? noticed it, um, Joseph or Kathy. Like, you know, I I was reading the last couple of days, and every other one was like about mars or about <laughs> i don't you know i don't i don't know there's so much in the slush pile and um we remark here in philly almost every meeting ends up having its own theme mm. you know um what was it just monday wasn't it something about blowing up or there's other like explosions or bones maybe bones, both. bones but yeah explosion and bones and you know there's frequently birds like if we get one bird then every poem's gonna have a bird <laughs> in it that night you know like <laughs> somehow that just happens i don't know maybe people are thinking and talking about space i don't know uh, uh, it, it, well, and the reason i just mentioned it too is like of course i think of major jackson's leaving saturn right mm-hmm. and of course i think of um tracy k smith life on mars right so and and for those poets, it's a kind of like Afrofuturism built into right the the their like like the tradition that they're working in. But Michelle's not there, right? Michelle is actually working in a kind of sentiment that um, it like she she borders on sentimentality, but she pulls it back with this articulation of emotion, which is really really cool. So yeah, I, agree. Yeah. I think we're ready to vote. Okay, um, one, two, three, vote. And it's unanimous. Thank you, Michelle Wolf. <laughs> to orbit the Earth. One done and one in. How exciting. Okay, so Marion and Joseph can virtually arm wrestle over who gets to read Expecting Snow. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joseph, do you have a preference? Do you want to read this one or the zebras one? Um, I can read this one. Do it. All cool. right, sound up. Here we go. Expecting snow. Against a sky and lake bleached icy gray, the solid surface edged with snow and spindly bones of leafless trees. Four silhouettes, a single file of ash brown deer. Two adults, two adolescents, halt their slow mo synchrony of steps at the middle of the lake, its top layer hardened to host weightlessness, not illusion on elegant legs. Beauty is no help. The starving deer, weary of feeding on bark and road salt, resume their lake top track. From spring through fall, the white-tailed locals feast on roses, carry ticks. One after another, they meet your eyes, and yet they leap onto the road, at the same bend where that drunk teen driver bashed the fence, then flipped. Nature holds you. When it drifts, it breaks your heart. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) <laughs> Joseph. Yeah, so I, I'm just going to jump in and say, so sorry. End damn poem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
like the ends of these poems are just out, outrageous and, and compelling. Mm-hmm. This one, um, it's, a, it's a little harder for me to be um, like swept up into the images, right? It feels um, a little bit uh, uh, slower to accumulate. Um, mm-hmm. And you'll note that I'm using snow references. Mm-hmm. <laughs> being swept up. Um, so yeah, but I thought the ending of this is just astonishing. Yeah. I really like the second stanza in response to the last line of the first stanza there. It's uh it's like mm-hmm. talking about what I get from it, it's sort of portraying this um oh words. Hmm. Like this presence of beauty and like gracefulness but and it's like there there's these deer just sort of gliding across this lake of ice but the lake isn't meant to hold them mm-hmm. and it's uh you know that f- last line to host weightlessness not illusion on elegant legs it's like these deer that look weightless and you know <laughs> look like they're doing great and doing fine they're not weightless and like they <clears throat> In that second stanza, 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 are starving and weary of feeding, and they're just sort of trying to make it across this lake that can't hold them, and it's a sort of morbid image that isn't resolved because it's like, you know, they could fall through the lake and freeze, but that image isn't, like, concluded there. So it's just this weird sort of melancholy feeling I get from that. Yeah, kind of lonely against the snow. Can somebody help me um, parse... The drunk teen driver who, yeah, can you help me with that? I'm not sure that that came in that came in in a, in a surprise way for yeah. me, but also so I, made me, I'm still trying to part, I, it's very slippery how it plays right. into this, this poem. Yeah. I also, um, I, shoot. You okay? No, I'm coughing. But I'm oh. fine. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. We'll let's cut the, this whole exchange up. Uh, so the poem, I think, works um, by a, a series of emergences, right? Like you're looking at, you know, like a snowy, snow encrusted lake in the distance on a gray day, right? So that's mm-hmm. gray on gray, and then you know, tree trunks, tree branches, and suddenly you realize they're they're not tree br- trunks or branches. This is, these are like four deer right sort of emerging in the in that atmosphere right so there's that's a lovely sort of visual that that she creates at the top and then and then i think in the description of this terrain it's also the sort of um this sort of like sudden fact right that this is also the place where uh you know a kid bashed a, a railing and died right so like the um it's that moment of recognition that allows her to get to like contemplating nature can hold you, right? Or that the icy lake can hold up these four deer, right? But at the same time, mm-hmm. right, threatens to break your heart, right? Right, right. So I, so I guess the, the parallels are, you know, it looks like it looks like the deer are, are uh, weightless, but they're weightless because they're starving, right? Mm-hmm. It looks like this lovely, you know, pristine <clears throat> snowscape but it's also um, a, a burial ground, right? Yeah, right, um, a place where you can die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least that's that's what I'm taking from mm-hmm. from it. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get to too. Um, so, when I, I there, there's a lot of beautiful imagery here, and thinking of the deer one after another, they meet your eyes in that yet they leap onto the road. Growing up in western Pennsylvania and then going to college in West Virginia and then being married to a man who loved the Poconos, I've met a lot of deer in the eye. (laughs) And I have always been amazed at how much they really do look. Like that's another thing where I think people think they're magical. Because when they stop and freeze, they really make you feel like they're looking at you, Mm -hmm. you know? So I kind of love that, the romantic idea of that, of the deer meeting you in the eye and then still leaping onto the road, like still not understanding what man can do to them. 
Right, that's that's a great, great point. Um, can you help me though with the end of that first stanza? This is what Joe was looking at, or Joseph was looking at the, I get that they halt their slow mo synchrony of steps at the middle of the lake, right? But I don't understand. The top layer hardened is the ice on the lake, right? Yeah. The host weightlessness, meaning it's not thin. I mean, it's it's too thin. It, it, it can only host weightlessness, right? Yeah. But like I don't that's... understand not illusion on elegant legs. Like, what? It's sort of it's... like saying this is what it's supposed to hold, not this. So just like with the line break there, so if we take it just like grammatically, the sentence, like the phrase is, it's top layer hardened to host weightlessness, not illusion on elegant legs. Wow. Yeah. Right, to host, yeah, so to host and weightlessness, then, yeah. not host illusion. Right. And then the illusion and then it goes on to elegant the, legs is the deer. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. And that like illusion on elegant legs is the beauty, which is no help in that second stanza there. Got it. And we got the spindly bones of the leafless trees, as well as those starving deer. You know, the images in the beginning. And I love lake, lake bleached ice gray and ash brown deer. Mm -hmm. Ash brown is so perfect. Yeah. It's just all these images and colors that just sort of portray a withering, hollowing winter mm -hmm. and just like paints that picture really perfectly. Shall we vote? I think maybe we do. Yeah. Okay. One, two, three, vote. And Michelle Wolf is two for two. Oh, Michelle Wolf. Where are you I don't going? think there's much dramatic right. tension in today's episode. Huh? <laughs> Although we could debate whether or not man really landed on the moon. We could go back. Oh, no. We could debate. I actually <laughs> I had a student in my creative writing class this term who, um, at the very last day of class, or maybe the next to last day, announced to the room that she did not believe that man had landed on the moon. And so she was, uh, you know, scoffed and and much debate blew up. And she ratcheted it, it back to, I think it is possible that we did not land on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty good stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and it did actually play into the class. Doesn't sound like it now, but it did. <laughs> we can also debate what time deer go to sleep. I actually mentioned that on a previous podcast that my father told us the deer go to sleep at seven. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. we believed him. Of course. Yeah, took me years to think, how does he know? <laughs> um, okay, so I think it's Marion's turn to read. I'm so excited to read Zebras in a Field. You would um, be. It's so perfect for you. I'm so glad it worked out this way. Yeah. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So it's a 15-line poem. I was wondering if she's working with sonnets at all one two three four five, six, seven, 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 seven. yeah okay sorry I was counting on your lines michelle counting on your lines here all right so zebras in a field the younger woman hollowed out reduced to a shadow wrapped in skin allowed the older one nearly her duplicate to enfold her they had both seen the knife a small glinty blade with a pearlized handle when it was set beside the younger woman's thigh. But you are not dead, the older woman, unable to speak, had wanted to say, although it may seem so, you will live an abundant life. Someday you will drive after 17 hours aloft along a paved road, edging a clutch of tumble down farms when a herd of zebras will race to meet the wooden fence, whinnying, tails flapping, oscillating your vision, the total scroll of what you know with the whirl of their stripes. Wowza. <laughs> nice read. Right? That's a wowza yeah. poem for me. Absolutely. I actually think this one really does some wildness. Um, and I have to, so I'm not 100% sure I get the scene of the poem, but mm -hmm. boy, boy, it sounds like there's some trauma here. Like, 
the older woman as witness to the younger woman's, you know, rape trauma. Something has happened with this knife next to her thigh, right? Mm -hmm. But you are not dead, the older woman unable to speak right like the the maneuver there had wanted to say yeah it's like a a fantasy of of proclamation fascinating awesome your vision the total scroll of what you know i'm getting that tattooed (laughs) the total scroll of what you know with the whirl of their stripes oscillating your vision yeah, yeah. Uh, again, amazing, amazing last lines, right? Yeah. Hmm. I just read this really terrific uh, George Saunders short story where the end made a similar move where we don't really find out what really happens to the protagonist. We only find out what he wished happened, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> that this reminds me of that. Um, I love that the older woman didn't actually say this, mm-hmm. <laughs> but wanted to. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Do people keep zebras on fa- in farms? I wonder, I don't know what don't zebras know. are used for. Are used, if they are used for anything, you mm-hmm. know, if they're kept anywhere. Yeah. That's a great question, right? And I and I wouldn't. I, I don't know in, in what country people keep zebras, right? Like right. Where, that's what I'm wondering. Where that's warm, but maybe, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Someday you will drive after 17 hours aloft. So that means she'll be somewhere else and fly back, right? Mm-hmm. Or then that must mean flying 17 hours aloft. Yeah, it's a long. Mm-hmm. So, some after after you take a long flight, you're going to be driving down a paved road, edged by tumble down farms somewhere in the world, right? Right. When a herd of zebras will race to meet the wooden fence. Right. I mean, that's what I like to think of this as: is that she will get go away. She will get away, go away, live somewhere else, right? Yeah. 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 Reduced to a shadow wrapped in skin. It's this poem has me pretty stumped. <laughs> <laughs> it's tight, tight, tight. <clears throat> yeah. Stumped. Yeah, you know what? I think stumped is right. Like, but I, it's, it's almost as if it's telling you a story from the side, whereas like yeah. the first, the first um, John Glenn is pretty straightforward description, right? Mm-hmm. Like. We're at this moon, you know, we can see the the spaceship, <laughs> right? And the yeah. memorial and and this, I'm gonna describe that and then I'm gonna reflect on that, right? Yeah. Whereas this is like, something has happened. There are two women, one's bearing witness to the other one. And this is what the older woman wishes she put, could possibly say. And it is like some sort of like incantation mm-hmm. that she doesn't say it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At least that's how I'm reading it. Mm-hmm. Right. Unable to speak. So, you know, who knows if it's from emotion or or why she's unable. Right. She's not just choosing not to, but she has right. unfolded the younger one, which I only imagine is a hug, right? Mm-hmm. She right. so Yeah. Uh, well, you know what I really love that we've gotten again thank you so much Michelle for sending these to us and I love how different they are from one another and how yeah, different each are. topic and subject are and the way they're handled you know mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. just wonderfully executed pieces all three mm-hmm. I don't think I get the knife They'd both seen the knife, a small, glinty blade with a pearlized handle, when it was set beside the younger woman's thigh. I think Marion already threw out a possible read, which is that the younger woman was attacked. Mm-hmm. Right? She's hollowed mm-hmm. out and reduced to a shadow wrapped in skin. Mm-hmm. So that's what the knife was, the threat. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. 
well, is that what you get? You said you don't get it. I don't think that's what I get from it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I don't know what I get from it. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's why I was sort of like bringing it back up, you know? Yeah, Joseph, I, I hear you. I think this, this poem like really activates the reader's brain. Like it like drives you to come to some kind of closure. It asks the reader mm -hmm. to sort of fill in and like imagine and like piece together a narrative. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of work for the reader to do, I think, right? And I actually like that. Like I like that there's like there's work to do, but it, it feels like a payoff for me. Mm -hmm. Like in in going, oh, okay, I get it. This is this is the narrative I imagine based on the evidence that she's giving me. And it's just like pieces rather than a whole yeah. explicit thing. Right. It's like the poem so I, is I, the but picture I do of hear, the puzzle. I hear you when you say you, you don't get it because you're not it doesn't it, it, like, you know, it, it, they don't cohere in a, in a legible narrative in a way, mm -hmm. right? Um, necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. I think that's why I like it, right? Because it's not on the nose. It's a little, like I said, it feels like violence, but told from the side. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and like some attempt to like soothe what is a wound that will never get healed well like holy soothed you know yeah. mm -hmm. it's and then, like i'm sorry go ahead it's like making you think about it yeah it's like yeah. it gives you the images and it gives you everything there but it's not going to tell you everything it's going to make you think about it and it's going to make you think through it and break it down and understand it really like on a more holistic personal level yeah and this i, I would say too like so in in some ways experimental poetry poetry can do that right mm -hmm. like it just you know gives you fragments and pieces and in, in you're you're doing a ton of work to sort of like uh, experience the idea or the imaginings of an experimental piece yeah this is not necessarily an experimental piece it feels to me like michelle's got a very clear sense of what the story is but her delivery of the story activates the reader's imagination right mm -hmm. like that it's that it's like the, the emotion of this tr narrative is heightened because you have to do the work of, of sort of guessing at what happened, right? So you're in this sort of like in it's like this incompleteness is is part of what activates for me the energy like this the sense of energy in the poem too, and the energy in me as a reader. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we're ready to vote. Dang, all right. All right. Here we go. One, two, three, vote. Sorry. Okay. Woohoo! Three for three. Surprise! <laughs> hey, Michelle Wolf, nice to see your work again, sister. Mm. Looking fabulous. Yeah. Looking fabulous. Very, very excited. Thank you so much. Um, anybody have anything they want to say? Anything you're reading? Anything doing? Anything? I actually have something interesting I want to talk about. Okay. If you don't mind. Hi, this is the engineer Joe. <laughs> so something really weird happened to me last night. I uh, came home, and on my outside window sill uh, was a paper crane with uh, th a throw quote on it. Wow. <laughs> and hey. it was. Uh, Uh, as if you could kill time without injuring eternity. And it was mislabeled uh, as a Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. <laughs> so somebody, wow. made it, somebody made an origami paper crane, put that quote, then uh, <laughs> mis, uh, misquoted, misquoted it. it. Yeah. By, and uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it's from an ex-girlfriend. <laughs> really? <laughs> that uh, deleted all, of, like told me never to contact her again and everything. <laughs> And so oh. she said that she was deleting my name and my everything from, from her phone. She's not on social media or anything, but I came home and just found an origami paper crane. Wow. Yeah, that's so. I love <laughs> this story. Is that, and Joe today is wearing a Beautiful World t-shirt. That's right. <laughs> and I just think that's a Beautiful World story. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, why do you think it's? Why do you think it's her? Why do you think it's this crazy I, girl? I recognize her handwriting. 
<laughs> Bless. She's not very sneaky. I don't think she's trying to be sneaky. I think she's trying to... to uh, let you know you can communicate with her if you'd like. I think so. But if not, it's a very random occurrence. None of my roommates had any idea what it was, but I immediately went is she, to there. Is she the kind of girl that would misquote Thoreau? Uh, or Emerson? She drinks, <laughs> she drinks a lot, so that's probably... <laughs> She thought it was a good idea at the time. Yeah. She said, look at me. I can still fold paper cranes. Yeah. I, I, I mean, she 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 was an origami hobbyist. <laughs> so. Oh, so that's a big clue. Uh-huh. The biggest clue. Okay, are you going to pursue this? Because our listeners are going to want updates. Um, most likely, I will write her, handwrite her a letter. Oh, uh-oh. He's pursuing it. Put oh. it and put it in her mailbox. Uh-oh. And say, continue with the original plan of not contacting me. Oh. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So anyway. Wow. That, I thought it, it fit the, the, uh, the form of the podcast, so I thought you guys would be interested. No, I, well, I like, love it. Well, okay. Your story is very much like Michelle's last poem about zebras, and that's, right? That's why totally. I, that's why I brought it up. It was too, too kismet not to bring it um, up. I, I just wrote down a potential title. Of paper yeah. cranes and zebras. <laughs> that's, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was more than perfect. See, that's what, it's a beautiful world. It's a beautiful world. How about that? <laughs> Last night that happened to him. Last night. That's right. And somehow with all the wind, it's very cold in Philly today and yesterday. And uh, uh, it, yes, it, it was not weighted down with anything. It was just sitting there. So, just chilling. Wow. Uh, anyhow, this is the most mic time I've ever had on this podcast. <laughs> so, bye. <laughs> well, we, we're going to have to get updates, though. No matter. Sure. We'll, we'll see if she responds to the letter. There's going to be more. I feel like there's going to be more. Mm-hmm. Oh, there could be pies on porch steps soon. Is that what you do? But you leave a man a pie? I don't know, but pies are cool. <laughs> <laughs> I like to bake lemon meringue pie. No, I can't ever like do that go-to. because everybody would know it was me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pie on a doorstep. Do you make lemon meringue pie? Yeah, I do. And you put it in the oven and have the meringue? Yeah. Wow, that's tricky, yeah. tricky. It is, but it is lovely. I love it. Yeah? Lemon meringue pie is the greatest. It's the only pie I make. That is a delicious pie, but I have never attempted it. No? No, you I'm should. A, and it's, I'm a cook. I'm, it's I'm quite not, a cook. I mean, if you're quite a cook, it's not that difficult. Yeah. It's just like you've got to be precise. You know, it's like the meringue. I think it's you have to whip it until there's like soft peaks, they call it. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, you lift up the whisk and it just sort of curls over like a little curl. Like one of these you know, little <laughs> curls. Um, <laughs> you got to whip it good. Yeah, you got to whip it good. Not till it's like, it's like there's different levels of peaks. There's like the soft <laughs> peak and the stiff peak. And then there's just like clods of meringue. You want it to be at that soft peak level and then it'll rise a little bit and look nice and pretty. Yeah. Last time I did it, I didn't whisk it enough. Oh. Yeah, so See, it that's was probably flat. why I don't do it. I, yeah. I'm not into baking nearly as much because baking then it, is it, so precise. It's very precise. It yeah. all gets all scientific up in there, yeah. and I'm not I'm not interested. I want to like throw this in and throw that in and try that. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? Interactive cooking. Mm-hmm. Um, what's what's going on there, Mayor? What's the last thing you made to eat? Quick, say it. Tell the truth. I don't know, she- Mayor. <laughs> did she get raptured again? She got raptured again. Oh, and we didn't get the end of that story from the last episode, <laughs> the Aaron and Darren Hodges episode. I mean, these are all yeah. scattered and like posted at different times anyway. But, but yeah. we didn't get that story again. Shoot. Yeah, but our, our loyal... She has, she has disappeared from the call. No. Yeah. Our most loyal of listeners probably do want to know if she was raptured. Yeah. Well, we now they know. She was, she not, was raptured, not raptured. But we don't time. know exactly what happened in Jordan. Remember, she was no, still... Yeah. Uh, or not Jordan... Uh, the Dead Sea. The, yeah. Where? She wasn't in Jerusalem. Where was she? I don't know. <laughs> There's another thing we need to know. <laughs> right, right. Okay, we have so many follow-up, so many follow-up episodes so many. to do. <laughs> but um, in the meantime... She's back. Oh, she's back. Hey, Hi, who's there? Hello? <laughs> it sounds exactly like a doorbell. It does. That's so funny. It sounded like one of the sun too. So sorry about that. And I'm I'm sure you guys have already said goodbye and ended the podcast. No, we no, did. No, not yet. Not yet. We were just talking about loose ends, like the story with the Dead Sea. 
how you got caught off in the Ariana Dare Hodges episode. I think I think that she bailed because we were talking about lemon meringue pie. <laughs> <laughs> and Joseph and I were like having a cook off right here yeah. in the studio. <laughs> and then I said, Marion, what's the last thing you made to eat? Tell the truth. And then you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> what's the last thing you whipped up in that uh, fabulous kitchen in Abu Dhabi? Mm. Assemble like a motherfucker. Like I know how to make like a tray of vegetables. <laughs> yes, Weird. you do. That's why you're good at the cocktailing. <laughs> you put out all the different things. You know, she's good at putting the things out mm-hmm. and having a lot of interesting good things. Nice. nice. Yeah, that's important. Very, very important. Um, you have your peanut <laughs> what? Did you have to have your peanut M Ms? <laughs> <laughs> yes, to peanut M Ms. She doesn't Always. put out peanut M Ms. I've never seen them. Maybe this winter at the beach we'll have peanut M Ms. Wait, you've never had peanut M Ms? Oh, I have, but Marion has never served them to me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like hold up. She has served many, many, many things to me, but not a peanut M Ms. Hmm. But uh, when she runs the beach house, I think we're gonna have to get some peanut M Ms up in there. Mm-hmm. No, I'm Jonesing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's like a taste fest in Marion's. <laughs> yeah. Lots of tasting. Awesome. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, okay, so do we have Miriam follow up on what happened? Do we have time? I say if we have time, yes. How long have we been going, Joe? 40 minutes. Mayor, we were afraid you got raptured again. <laughs> it happens. It does. You know, I know. It's, you know, it's kind of funny that you said that because, okay, I'm oh. sitting here, I'm looking out my beautiful window at my beautiful apartment building, and like, Maybe like tic tac toe style, you can see Christmas trees. Like there's a bunch of people here in Abu Dhabi <laughs> with their Christmas trees all lit up and blinking. It's kind of nice. nice. Anyway, nice. kind of like the raffle. Looking yeah. out the window at the horizon of Abu Dhabi with Christmas trees. <laughs> Maybe we can save the rapture follow up for a tag material on the Abu Dhabi episodes because they're going to be being released soon too. In uh, fact, yeah. they might leapfrog right over this one. I'm not yeah. sure. Um, so uh, on that note, uh, readers do communicate with us. Tell us what you like to bake. Is baking better than cooking? Um, <laughs> it'll be like, you know, the last big debate we had, our yeah. dogs. Better than cats. Better than cats. Our cats <laughs> killing machines. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, follow us on all the different social media platforms. Tell us what you're thinking. Uh, tell us anything you'd like to hear here on this show. And um, keep reading. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>